Hey guys, it's D-Mike, back for another episode. Last time we completed the tail cave, we went and rescued our friend Bow Wow here, the chain chomp, and we were told that there is some shenanigans afoot in the swamp north of town. So we're going to go ahead and take care of that in this episode. But before we do that, there is a fun little mini game that's in Mob Bay Village that you could play in the original, but it's since been updated a little bit. I think it's a lot of fun. You can get some pretty cool prizes from it. We're just going to play around with it a little bit right here. We'll come back to it later. It's only 10 rupees. And can catch some pretty nice stuff. Pretty cool. So you're going to want to try and catch the biggest fish that you can. The first goldfish that you're going to want to get is actually the one that's the closest to the shore. So we're going to try to make that happen here. You can use the left stick to kind of move your bobber around. You're going to want to get the fish's attention until it bites. Give him a little bit. He's being fickle. So there you go. Also, that reaction is adorable. And if you don't think that that's adorable, then I'm afraid that you're wrong. So catching that first fish nets you the middleweight lure. You can find yourself in a little bit of a better position to catch the bigger fish that net you the bigger prizes by using this lure, which is a little better than the original one. There's another lure that you can get additionally, but that's if you're going to spend some real time with it. I might dedicate a little mini episode to just this fishing mini game because there's more. It's more in depth and I really want to spend a ton of time on it. The real reason why I came to do this here is because catching that first fish will net you a piece of heart. So if you are playing this mini game, you can change lures between the middle and lightweight. There is another one as well, but we'll not worry about that now. We're just going to go ahead and be satisfied with our initial catch. So as you saw, we were able to get a piece of heart out of that, which is pretty sweet. And this is empty now because those four pieces of heart when combined give us a fifth heart container. So that's a pretty good grab. We will come back to that at some point, but we've got some business to take care of. This series, because of this game being a little bit on the shorter side, it's a little tough to, to really pad it out. You're gonna have to expect most of every episode is going to be filled with some sort of progress. I am trying to be more patient and take my time with it because I don't want this to turn into a speed run or people to think that I'm trying to blast through this game. When I originally recorded this series on my old channel, every episode was either exploration or me beating a dungeon and I spent a lot of time rehearsing what I was trying to do. Which is fine, I mean... I was making progress and I was getting through the game, but I had rehearsed every dungeon so well that there wasn't really any element of... surprise? It wasn't unexpected, I guess? I want to take more time with this version of my Let's Play and... show that I'm not... the perfect Let's Player. I mean, there are going to be times when I make mistakes and... It's more, I don't know, it just feels more authentic. More fun that way. There are mistakes, there are errors, there, the reactions that I will make to those will be more fun than if I could plow through this like a robot. So anyway. History aside, this is why we were instructed to bring Bow Wow with us. There are two different types of plants in the swamp that he can take care of. The little ones that slightly impede your progress and then these larger ones that actually fire spores at you. So if those hit you, they 
It will cause you to take damage. You don't want that. Try to get, get out of the way. There is fish in the swamp as well. Those are kind of frustrating. But most everything in this area is pretty easy to dodge. I feel like they could have potentially done a little more with this area in the original and made it actually kind of like a little bit of a maze. But, I mean, you can see what I'm doing. There's not really anything to be too concerned about. It's pretty simple. But picking up that chest is, I think, the only real motivation you have for sticking around. Other than that, you're going to want to jump right into the dungeon. So Bawa goes ahead and takes care of all those flowers for us. There is this rock that you've seen around the overworld as well as here. And that's something that we won't be able to really deal with until after the dungeon is done. But as much as I would love to take Bawa in to help us for dungeon number two, he's going to have to stay outside like Yoshi in Super Mario World. So welcome to level two, the Bottle Grotto. This is a... I mean, it's another relatively easy dungeon. The first couple in this one, I would say, are. I mean, I could say that about all of them because I played this game enough times to know. But I would say even for a beginning player, it's still probably on the relatively easy side. I maybe had a little trouble with this one when I was a child just because... Some of the some of the mechanics of this one are a little tough. There actually is a notorious part of this dungeon that I am going to do my best to faithfully recreate. If you don't pick up the specific, I guess, helper item that you could get in this dungeon, then it won't. You'll you'll probably be spending a lot of time frustrated with what you're trying to do. If you played this before, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, well, that's not cool. I definitely press, I definitely press jump. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna try to pick up as many of, I guess, the missable items. This is the one I was referring to. This is the stone beak that will be. This one is actually very useful in this dungeon. The other dungeons, when you pick it up, they kind of give you little hints, which are hit or miss. I mean, if you're familiar with the series and you know what you're doing, then it's not really going to be anything that you're unfamiliar with. But if you're new, it is definitely useful and. Specifically in this dungeon alone, there is a room that, without this hint, you won't really be able to do it correctly without a bunch of trial and error. And, you know, when I was a kid and I saw that, I would sometimes get so frustrated I would just turn my game off. So, the statues, like I said, are hit or miss. This one just tells you about crystals. When you hit them, they raise and lower the floor. This mechanic. And the reason why I think this game is so successful now and when, you know, when it came out is just because of how they approach, I guess, grooming the player for bigger and better obstacles. They'll start you out small, they'll give you a little taste of what you're supposed to do. Then they ramp up the difficulty a little bit with something a little bigger and bolder. It's kind of a nice touch. That's just good game design. I mean, this is coming from... I don't think this game was made actually by Nintendo's A-Team. I think this was like a little side project for them. So if they were able to pull something off like this, then you know that it's just a quality production altogether. I'm being biased as well because I love this game and, you know, I've always been a fan of Nintendo and their AAA IPs. That was our first introduction to Shy Guys. That's another Mario throwback illusion. Okay. I believe those are Stalfos, or at least the one that was down here was. It could be. Those might be stall blends, maybe the ones that are like uh, moblins that are dead. I could be getting all of this wrong, like I said. Feel free to correct me in the comments if I'm off base here. As much as I'd love to say I have an encyclopedic knowledge of this game, I don't. It's 
more of a nostalgic endearment. We'll say that. Coming back to it every time is just a lot of fun. This is one of those games that you can just play numerous times, even though it's relatively short and easy. And they've done enough with it that it's fresh enough. I think the one complaint that a lot of people had is that the game didn't change drastically enough to accommodate a more veteran player, which is kind of true. And also, this game, when it was released, was put up with the full $60 price tag US, which I know that that turned a lot of people off because this game is relatively short. I would say, you know, realistically speaking, if you're trying to become a completionist of this game, you could probably beat it in about 15 to 20 hours, maybe even less than that if you're really hauling it. But I wasn't going to pass this up when I saw it. But I could understand if somebody who's maybe on a budget or isn't quite as fanatical about Zelda, maybe this would be one that you'd pass on because of that price tag, which is unfortunate. I don't remember how much the Game Boy game would have retailed for back then. I think re Game Boy games were like 30 or $40 back in... I want to say this game came out in like the... The mid to late 90s? Or maybe earlier than that, I don't know. It was a black and white Game Boy game, so it might have been sooner. So I could understand that for some people, that price point then might have made sense. Adjusted for inflation, maybe it's the same. But $60 for a triple A AAA title, you know, you're expecting a lot. So I would, I would understand if maybe uh, some people would be turned off by that. But, like I said, I'm one of those people who is going to get this no matter what. So, one of the things that is worth noting... Let's actually... I'll hold that thought for this mini-boss. This is actually a pretty tough mini-boss, the way they designed it in this game. I'm, I, I might mess this up. Yeah, I'm already doing great, as you can see. This is why I wanted to... Okay, so that happened. This is why I wanted to play the game. And when I'm commentating, this is live commentary as well. Some people are... more in tune with... post-commentary, but I feel like live commentary gets you a more authentic... take on what you're doing. But yeah, that's, our, that's the mini-boss for this dungeon. Once again, don't remember what he's called. So I'm doing great. Maybe I should just link, like, a Zelda wiki in the description of some of these. This is the reason why this stone beak is very important in this dungeon. If you don't remember this order of operations for these enemies that you have to kill, then you're gonna have to do the rinse and repeat. This is for a room that's later on in the game, actually. It's not this one, but that staircase will take you to it. So it's telling you that there's an enemy that... The pole's voice in this game, it looks like a rabbit, rabbit's head. So you want to kill that first, and the last thing that you want to kill is the Stalfos, which we've already run into one of those. If you do it in any other order besides that, there's also a keys in that room, I believe. If you do that in any other order, then the room will just lock you out, and you won't be able to progress. So that's obviously... It can be a point of contention for a new player. And I totally understand the frustrations that are derived from having to deal with that. Let's take a quick peek at the map. Nope, that's a map button. So this dungeon is shaped like a bottle, crazy. But it's pretty straightforward. I mean, they have you start, you can see where I'm at. Um, you can venture over to the right a little bit, but there's not really a ton of progress that you can make. You literally are just going to be essentially going clockwise through the dungeon to finish it, which is pretty nice. Once again, very well-designed levels, well-designed maps, tutorials, you know, all of those things. I mentioned in the first episode that one of the... Oh, bye-bye, piece of power. One of the things I mentioned in the first episode about that powder is that you can essentially find it in the overworld or in dungeons in certain spots and in quantities that are sufficient enough that you won't really need it. 
I don't think I've ever really used the powder to do anything with enemies. It's just required for lighting up a room to progress. I don't know. I mean, you don't really need that much. I mean, I, you might be able to get through the entire game on... on one sack, you know? You just sack up once and you're good. So, these boos are scared away from light. This is the key item of this dungeon. Power bracelet. I just remember how confused I was as a kid playing this game because when you see these pots that are around the dungeon, I could never get them out of the way. If you touch them, then you would get a little indicator saying, no, you can't do this until you have an item. That got really annoying because you couldn't avoid it. The hitbox for these pots, for some reason, was big enough that you would always run into it and you'd always get that hit text box and it would just be so frustrating to have to deal with. So I was never really a fan. But what's nice, quality of life thing, again, the power bracelet, the sword, the shield are now mapped to buttons. There's no having to move it around your item select screen. It does it for you. Very convenient. Just another quality Nintendo move, if you know what I'm saying. So if you toss that pot at that switch, it's actually a kind of a nice little way to go over here, nab this chest. That is what I believe the final small key of this dungeon. So that's pretty convenient. Heading south after we take care of these keys in this switch. Excuse me, just gonna move right past you. So if you remember correctly, it said that we needed to take care of the Pole's voice first, and then the Stalfos last. So this room can be kind of annoying. The Stalfos is gonna be, well, I guess can't do that. He's gonna be throwing spears at us. We need to unleash the beast here, the Stalfos, or getting the Stalfos out of the way so we can Come after the pole's voice. Get rid of the rabbit. Tricks are not for kids. And then, okay, well, so much for that. But following that, Owl's Beak suggestion gets you the boss key. Pretty cut and dry, pretty simple. And like I was saying, if you take this Staircase here. It'll pull you into another underground segment. Piranha plants. So they really came in hot and heavy with these allusions to Nintendo. I'm assuming that as like the B team of the people who are creating this, it was just kind of a love letter to Zelda and to Nintendo in general, which I think is really nice. And maybe this was an attempt for them to kind of make their mark a little bit. Because this was the first Zelda handheld. So coming fresh off the immense success of Link to the Past, you know, they had to do something special. And this was something that I believe they made in their spare time, which is unfathomable to me. You know, this is something I'm making in my spare time. And as much as effort as I'm putting into this, I can't imagine how much additional effort it must take to code and develop a a AAA title like this, and even though it's a, it's one of the simpler games in the series. Just incredible. Kudos to the to that group of folks. This is one of the few times in the game that you can pick up a pot and carry it up a ladder. You need it to weigh down this platform. He's having a rough go. I'm sure we've all made that face sometime in our lives for various circumstances. You can fill in the blanks yourself. But the dungeon's already done. Go ahead and peep our map one last time. Pretty simple, pretty standard. A very fun boss coming up, I really enjoy this. I believe I was actually pretty scared of this boss when I was a kid, having watched this. 
its character design here is pretty is pretty good, but I remember having seen this when I was younger, playing this game for the first time on the Game Boy. You know, it kind of gives you the willies. If you're afraid of clowns, I, I apologize. So, what you have to do is go ahead and dodge his fireballs. When he is done, you can hit his bottle with a nice whack of your sword. It will immobilize him in the bottle. You can take it and throw it at the wall. Rinse and repeat. There's the rule of thirds for Nintendo, of course. Three hits will do it. There is a really cool speedrunning way to do this, where you have to abuse some sort of mechanic. I can't remember it off the top of my head, but it's pretty impressive, where I believe you can one-cycle this guy. All right, so. We've made him quite upset. I mean, we evicted him from his home, so I would be pretty upset too. He's gonna throw a larger fireball at us. Once he... becomes corporeal. But I actually need to be a little careful here. I'm kind of being a little reckless. Wait for him to throw the fireball again. I want to say that that's kind of the same sound effect that uh, the main the main boss from A Link Between Worlds, the Yuga, makes when you hit him. Her? I don't know what, if that's accurate, but it sounds right. So we made this one by the skin of our teeth. Congrats, everybody. We did it. Two dungeons in the bag. And for those who are f fans of Spongebob, got the magic conch. The world is our oyster. All right, so we're going to be prairie dogging it. After this point, the game really opens up and kind of lets you explore around. Now that we've got the ability to lift rocks, we can do a little bit more exploration. We actually need to do the right thing here and take Bow Wow home to his rightful owner, to Madam Meow Meow. So we'll do that next time. Hopefully this was a fun, relaxing, chill sesh for everybody watching. Once again, hope you're keeping it real. This has been D-Mike. I'll see you next time. Bye. Hey guys, D-Mike here. If you enjoyed this episode, consider liking the video and subscribing to the channel. It helps me out a lot. Thanks.